You may call me Reuven. I am a Ukrainian Jew and a survivor of Yanoska, a Nazi concentration camp on the outskirts of Lvov, combining elements of labor, transit, and extermination. On November 19, 1943, I was among the Sonderkommando, inmates who staged a revolt against the Germans and attempted a mass escape. Most were recaptured and murdered, but a few of us got away. After the war, I found my way to Palestine, where I fought in Israel's War of Independence. Nowadays, I am able to comment on the tragedy that befell the Jews of Europe. Let's begin by focusing on this fact. Between the Wannsee Conference of January 20th, 1942, and a report issued on September 30th, 1942, some two million Jews in central Poland were murdered. We've all heard of the atrocities committed in gas chambers and ovens in places like Auschwitz. But how did all of this really come about? At the outset, we need a little background about the precise fate of Poland during World War II. In August 1939, a secret protocol known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed, dividing Northern and Eastern Europe into German and Soviet spheres of influence. When the war broke out on September 1, 1939, the USSR moved in from the East. On September 28, Poland was divided into three parts. The East and the Baltic states went to Russia. Western Poland was annexed to Germany. That left Central Poland, which was to be German-controlled, civilian, and not directly annexed. It would be called the General Government, the Generalgouvernement. At its head was the infamous Hans Frank, a veteran Nazi who behaved as a local Hitler. Its headquarters would be in Krakow, not Warsaw, a direct insult to the Poles. Under my authority, 12 cabinet ministries were established, along with four district governments. These were based around the large cities, Krakow, Warsaw, Radom, and Lublin. The region of Galicia, including the city of Lviv, was incorporated in the summer of 1941, becoming the 5th district. Each district was divided into counties, including urban and rural units, all with great detail. In some places, the bureaucracy ran well, in others, miserably. In general, administrative patterns were copied directly from Germany proper. There was also a strong and growing competition between the district regime and the central regime. The question was, who is in charge of local affairs? The central government or the local government? Sensing the confusion, Berlin sometimes sent representatives to various localities, bypassing Frank altogether. I was Reichsführer SS and Minister of the Interior, both cabinet ministries. I believe myself to be in charge of all police matters, even though technically I am of a lower rank than Frank, though my apparatus is in direct competition with Frank. I am beneath Himmler in the chain of command. I serve as head of the RSHA, the main office of Reich Security, a conglomeration of offices under the SS, part of which is the Gestapo, the Geheimstaatspolizei, or State Secret Police, along with the SD, the Intelligence Service. Also under the SS was ORPO, the regular police, incorporated into the SS in 1936. In charge was Kurt Delug, parallel with Heydrich, in the SS. Consequently, competing orders were often given to the Einsatzgruppen. All the while, Frank considered his police superior to the SS and vice versa for Himmler. 
Next, we should consider the HSSPF or Higher SS in Police Leader, of whom there were about 30 in Europe. The HSSPF acted as the local Himmler, always ready to cut through red tape to get things done, basically to skirt around the bureaucracy, outside of the established structure. The HSSPF would simply step in as needed. In Krakow, it was Kruger, but beneath the HSSPF was yet another bureaucrat, the SSPF. In Lublin, that official was Odilo Globocznik. My job is basically to bypass Kruger, as needed, answering only to Himmler. I consider myself the head of what is called Operation Reinhardt. As for Reinhard Heydrich himself, he was assassinated in May 1942 by the Czech underground. Oddly enough, Heydrich had almost nothing to do with the murder of the Jews of the General Gouvernement. Yes, he was in charge while he lived of the overall final solution, and he proved that at Von Z. But its local implementation was outside his jurisdiction. Moreover, Heydrich's Einsatzgruppen were by no means alone, even in the initial stages of the genocide. And throughout those initial stages, competition was extremely fierce around Jewish policy. In the end, the SS emerged victorious over Hans Frank, but civilians remained in charge of day-to-day -day affairs. Civilian administrators were the ones who established the ghettos, and the Judenrater reported to civilians, not the SS. Why then did a prominent Nazi and SS leader end up in charge of Operation Reinhardt? Because of his particular skill set? Because he happened to be located in Lublin? Why was Lublin chosen by the Nazis as the city in Poland where Jews would be concentrated? The notorious Lublin Reservation? The answer to that lies in the simple fact that Lublin had for centuries been the main rabbinic center of world Jewry, drawing to its yeshivas some of the best Jewish students in Europe. Even many American Jewish communities recruited their rabbis from this region. The Nazis were doubtless convinced that holding Jews as hostages in Lublin would somehow weaken the conspiratorial web of world Jewry. It might well have been that whichever Nazi happened to be presiding over Lublin would have been chosen to head up Operation Reinhardt. But it might also have been that Globochnik would have gotten the job wherever he was located. After all, I was personally indebted to Himmler, who had stepped in and saved me just before I was about to be put on trial for embezzlement. For that reason I would go out of my way to please Himmler. I basically trampled Hans Frank's people. As SSPF, I would bypass the HSSPF, Kruger, just to get things done. I took my orders directly from Himmler to build Maidanek, to create SS and police colonies in the occupied USSR, and to organize Polish Jews for forced labor, which was originally my own idea. I determined the places and the nature of the murder, the manpower required, and the preparation of the Jews themselves. I sent out observers to evaluate the nature of the killings taking place in the USSR. The reports that came back were that mass shooting was not sufficiently effective. Some of the shooters were traumatized by the experience. Furthermore, it was a waste of bullets. I noticed, however, that Hitler's euthanasia program had officially ended in August 1941. Consequently many workers in that program, who had experience with gassing victims, were requisitioned to work for the larger genocide. It was decided that carbon monoxide would be put to use for this purpose. Deported Jews from the Lodz ghetto 
were led through a basement corridor and then up a ramp to a small windowless room that turned out to be the cargo area of a large van. Once the van was full, the doors were slammed shut, and as it was driven to a nearby forest, exhaust fumes were rooted into the back, asphyxiating the trapped victims. In September 1941, the Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, ordered the use of a gas used as a disinfectant and pesticide called Zeklon B for the extermination. The logistics of the genocide itself were revolutionary, and the idea was not that the murderers should go to the victims, but that the victims should be brought to the murderers. Using the railroads for whatever was to be done with the Jews appears to have been an early idea, but as the death camps came into focus, it was important that they be located on railroad lines. Sobibor, for example, was a small town on a railroad line. Belsek was also a small village on a central railroad line. And Treblinka was on a railroad line in close proximity to Warsaw. An engineer working for the SS by the name of Kurt Gerstein left us some important personal notes. He took no satisfaction in what he observed, but does that excuse him on any level from his participation in the SS? He later maintained to friends that this experience made him determined to inform the world of the horrors taking place. In Lublin, SS Gruppenführer Globochnik was waiting for us. He said, This is one of the most highly secret matters there are, perhaps the most secret. Anybody who speaks about it is shot dead immediately. Two talkative people died yesterday. Then he explained to us that, at that time August 17, 1942, there were the following installations. 1. Belzec, on the Lublin Lvov Road, in the sector of the Soviet Separation Line. Maximum per day, 15,000 persons. I saw it. 2. Sobibor, I am not familiar with the exact situation, I did not visit it. 20,000 persons per day. 3. Treblinka, 120 kilometers north, northeast of Warsaw. 25,000 per day, saw it. 4. Majdanek, near Lublin, which I saw when it was being built. Globochnik said, you will have very large quantities of clothes to disinfect, 10 or 20 times as much as the textiles collection, which is only being carried out in order to camouflage the origin of the Jewish, Polish, Czech and other items of clothing. Your second job is to convert the gas chambers, which have up to now been operated with exhaust gases from an old diesel engine, to a more poisonous and quicker means, cyanide. As we know, the quicker means turned out to be Zyklon B. Here then are the six major death camps established by the Nazis. Auschwitz, built in 1940, converted to a death camp in 1941. Chelmno, built in December 1941, originally utilizing gas vans. Belzec, built in March 1942. Majdanek, built in the summer of 1941, converted to a death camp in 1942. Sobibor, built in April 1942. Treblinka, built in July 1942. I am also in charge of providing staff for the camps. I train them in a town near Lublin called Troniki. About 2,000 SS have been trained, but there aren't nearly enough to go around. So a good many non-Germans have also been trained, including Ukrainians, Latvians, and Estonians. Altogether, some 35,000 staff have been made ready, though not all are being used at the same time. 
once I rerouted an entire SS unit to Bielostok to suppress an uprising there. That of course was my job description, to intervene around the bureaucratic system as needed. When preparing the Jews for their extermination, I begin by taking a census, matching them with our needs. They are then issued new identity cards. A type A card means that the person is skilled, and will be sent to get away. A type B card means unskilled, and that the person will be sent to ghetto B. The fate of those in ghetto B is obvious. Of course, many places had no ghettos at all. Some ghettos were established before the mass murder began, others afterward. Whether those early ghettos were set up in anticipation of the genocide to follow is something still debated. But it's clear that from late 1941 on, all ghettos were established with the clear intent of mass murder. As 1942 dawned, all bureaucratic competition over the outworking of the genocide vanished. From then on, Operation Reinhard, named posthumously for the assassinated Reinhard Heydrich, functioned as a well-oiled machine. The three distinct parts of Operation Reinhard included organized deportations under a senior commander named Hermann Hoffle. The operation of the camps themselves under police captain Christian Wirth and the confiscation of the booty and loot. Some argue that it was in fact Wirth who upgraded and effectively ran the program. In any case, Adam Cherniakov, head of the Warsaw Ghetto Judenrat, on the eve of the deportation in 1942, made a diary entry that tells us everything we need to know. July 22nd, 1942, at the community at 7.30 in the morning. The borders of the small ghetto are guarded by a special unit in addition to the usual one. At 10 o'clock, Sturmbannführer Höfler appeared with his people. We disconnected the telephone lines. The children were transported out of the little garden. It was announced that we Jews, without regard to sex or age, apart from certain exceptions, would be deported to the east. 6,000 had to be delivered by 4 o'clock today. And this, at least, is how it will be every day. Sturmbannführer Heufle called me into the office and informed me that my wife was free at the moment, but if the deportation failed, she would be the first to be shot as a hostage. The next day, Chernyakov committed suicide. As for Globochnik, he himself committed suicide after the war, while in prison. The personal notes of Kurt Gerstein at the extermination camp at Belsek fill in the rest of the story. Next morning, a few minutes before 7 o'clock, I was told that the first train would arrive in 10 minutes. And in fact the first train from Lvov arrived a few minutes later. There were 45 carriages with 6,700 persons, of whom 1,450 were already dead on arrival. Through small openings closed with barbed wire one could see yellow, frightened children, men, and women. The train stopped, and 200 Ukrainians, who were forced to perform this service, tore open the doors and chased the people from the carriages with whips. Then instructions were given through a large loudspeaker, the people are to take off all their clothes out of doors and a few of them in the barracks, including artificial limbs and glasses. Shoes must be tied in pairs with a little piece of string handed out by a small four-year-old Jewish boy. All valuables and money are to be handed in at the window marked valuables, without any document or receipt being given. The woman and girls must then go to the barber, who cuts off their hair with one or two snips. The hair disappears into large potato sacks, to make something special for the subarinus, to seal them and so on. The duty SS, junior squad leader explained to me. Then the march starts. 
barbed wire to the right and left, and two dozen Ukrainians with rifles at the rear. They came on, led by an exceptionally pretty girl. I myself was standing with police captain Worth in front of the death chambers. Men, women, children, infants, people with amputated legs, all naked, completely naked, moved past us. In one corner there is a whimsical SS man who tells these poor people in an unctuous voice. Nothing at all will happen to you. You must just breathe deeply, that strengthens the lungs. This inhalation is necessary because of the infectious diseases, it is good disinfection. When somebody asks what their fate will be, he explains that the men will of course have to work, building streets and houses. But the woman will not have to work. If they want to, they can help in the house or the kitchen. A little glimmer of hope flickers once more in some of these poor people, enough to make them march unresisting into the death chambers. But most of them understand what is happening, the smell reveals their fate. Then they climb up a little staircase and see the truth. Nursing mothers with an infant at the breast, naked, many children of all ages, naked. They hesitate, but they enter the death chambers, most of them silent, forced on by those behind them, who are driven by the whip lashes of the SS men. A Jewish woman of about 40, with flaming eyes, calls down revenge for the blood of her children on the head of the murderers. Police Captain Worth in person strikes her in the face five times with his whip and she disappears into the gas chamber. So many who revolted against our captors in Janoska that day in 1942 perished at the hands of the Nazi murderers. I alone am escaped to tell you.